Washington, D.C. is many things, but it has always been a president's town. They live in the White House. They help make policy at the Capitol. Their shadows are always casting down, defining the time by their tenure. There are a handful of names that come to the forefront when you visit this city. For different reasons, they have stood out, such is the case, of course, for Abraham Lincoln. His time in office was marked by so much, so was his death. It is the fascination that extends to his cottage. That's right. Lincoln had a cabin, if you will, about three miles from his primary residence. So ironically, the White House is three miles away. That's right. And the commute time by horse and buggy, in his case, when he lived here and today, is the same. That's right. It took him about <laughs> 45 minutes then by horse or carriage, and that's about how much time it'll take to drive to the White House today. About here. 45 minutes, yep. but uh, we get to go bumper to bumper and Bumper to horn, bumper huh? with all the traffic lights, yeah. Just up the hill, he would bring his family, and now it is a landmark in part because there is such a general fascination with the man. So you walk in here and you got great natural light. Yep. I mean, a realtor's dream. What, what is this? This is where they would come in. Yeah, so this is the same entrance that the Lincoln family would have used when they came out here. And this was the grand hallway. And then it's basically all the public spaces that the Lincolns enjoyed. This was a much more private place for them than the White House, but they still entertained a lot of visitors here. And they had a lot of uninvited and unexpected guests that made their way out here too. It was in his cottage he could move outside the gridlock. You know the kind. The same kind that exists today, only without computers. From time to time, a guest would stop by, sometimes unannounced and sometimes underappreciated. But for example, here we often tell the story of a colonel who came to see Lincoln um, after a steamboat accident because his wife had drowned in this steamboat accident and he couldn't retrieve her body. So he comes and appeals to the president. We know that he'd had a very difficult day downtown, but of course Colonel Scott didn't know that. So when he asks Lincoln for this favor, he gets a reaction that he's not expecting. Which is? That Lincoln tells him, uh, am I to have no rest? Is there no hour nor day when I may escape this call? Why are you coming to me with this? Why don't you go to the War Department? And Colonel Scott's taken off guard um, and ends up going away. But the next morning, Lincoln goes down to his hotel and offers to personally take him to the front and give him the necessary papers so that he can cross that front line. His time in office was marked by one issue, of course, slavery in the Civil War. And it was here he would spend time penning one of his most famous and transformative doctrines in the history of the country. So this is a replica of the desk where he sat down and penned some of the most famous verbiage in American history. Absolutely. Um, Lincoln himself said that if his name ever goes into history, it'll be for this act. And he was referring to the Emancipation Proclamation. And right here is where he would have thought about right. that. Right. And put pen to paper. Yes. Wow. So this, um, we know that uh, the desk, the original, is in the Lincoln bedroom of the White House. But they allowed us to make this replica um, when we opened to the public in 2008. He has been portrayed as somber, introverted, a deep thinker. You get the feeling this cottage was a fit for his demeanor. We get that from his contemporaries, that they come, maybe they disturb his silence, but they come across him and he's sitting by himself, you know, thinking about things, or we know that he would walk the grounds here at the soldier's home at night. In the middle of his life in this second home was his wife, Mary, herself committed to causes and family. Mary Lincoln was a woman who suffered a lot in her life, um, including the death of three children and her husband beside her. She was also a very learned woman. She actually had more schooling than Lincoln. When they lost a child, Mary had a seance in what they think was this room. Who was here? Well, Noah Brooks is actually the one who recorded it because the president was concerned um, that these uh, mediums were fraudsters and that Mary Lincoln was being taken in by this. The upstairs featured four rooms. So up here, you have the... Uh... A standard four bedroom? <laughs> right, right. There are, uh, there are actually five, five rooms, five bed chambers on this level. Um, one that might have been a sunroom or something of that nature. Um, and there's a lot of speculation as to which room would have been Lincoln's bedroom. Out on the porch, you get the sense Lincoln would come to look out, to think, to try and solve the issues that had overtaken and almost divided a country. Do you think he had a lot of advisors come out here and sit with him and talk, or was this more solitude? No, we know he had a lot of advisors out here. Um, 
Senator Orville Browning was one who was a friend back from Illinois. We also know that Secretary of War Stanton came out here and actually sometimes occupied another house on the grounds, which no longer is here, unfortunately. It feels like Lincoln. It allows your mind to wander and challenges you to try to understand the complexity of those times, of the decisions no other president had to make, and how it all ended for him. And you are left to wonder a bit what would have been and why his place in history is what it is. We know what would have been different, but it's hard to say exactly how it would have been different. Reconstruction certainly would have been different for this country. Lincoln outlines in the second inaugural what he sees um, as the way forward, and we didn't really live up to that ideal, to that vision. Life to the Max is brought to you by LifeTouch, photography for a lifetime.